I'm Diane Bruce, and I'm really thrilled to uh, be introducing Allison. I actually have an advanced copy of the book. I'm almost finished with the book, and um, for me, it's been um, a very fabulous read. My father actually was general superintendent of U.S. Steel, so he actually had Charles Morgan's job well after Charles Morgan. Um, and my father had the same experience, I think, as being general superintendent, where he really wanted to sit and and make drawings and come up with new machinery and instead he had to worry about human resources and where the stuff was coming from and the next shipment and those kinds of things. Um, so it's just been a wonderful experience for me to read this book um, and also as someone who's lived in Worcester my whole life who also um, has benefited from a lot of the stuff that the Morgan family has done for the community. Um, it's just been wonderful and I'm thrilled that Allison you know, took the time, which was a lot of time, to write this book which is a fabulous history of Worcester. So, Allison. Thank you very much, Diane. That was very kind of you. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Just need to get this open. Okay, well, I am really pleased to be here today, particularly because my in laws, Hoagie and Ann Hansen, have been dedicated Rotarians for years down in the Philadelphia area. Um, Ann's been president of her Swarthmore Club and Hoagie was a district governor, and then when he flunked retirement from Haverford College, he, they both moved out to Evanston and worked for Rotary International for several years. Um, they both still travel to Rotary training sessions, and they drove from Swarthmore up to Canada just a couple of weeks ago, so they're still into it. So I understand the, the Rotary motto of service above self, and so I thought I would share with you some examples of how Charles Hill Morgan, although he was not a Rotarian himself, lived out that motto in his own life. But before I start, however, I need to ask, um, before you received the notice about today's meeting, how many of you had heard of Charles Hill Morgan? But if you're related to him, that doesn't count. <laughs> Show of hands, who had actually heard of Charles Hill Morgan? Yeah, a smattering. Okay, that, that's about what I expected. A hundred years ago, um, the answer would have been quite different. Everyone knew who he was. And that was one of several challenges for my book the first being that I had never written a biography before. I'm one of those people who figured out how to use their English major as a launching point for their career. I've been a working writer since my first job in a New York public relations firm. My first assignment was to write a brochure about the New York Clearing House, which was describing how checks were cleared, or they, how they used to be back in the 1980s. But if asked, I would say my favorite type of writing is a profile, whether it's capturing a life's work in an alumni magazine article or in a larger form, such as a multi-page brochure produced at the time of someone's retirement, as I did for Philip Morgan a couple of years ago. So let me give you some background on how this book came to be. Uh, back in June, June 2006, just about eight years ago now, Paul Morgan pulled me aside during a lunch for Morgan Construction's retirees. I was there to find new stories from the old timers to include in the employee newsletter, The Square and Crescent. I had no idea I'd find a story about the oldest timer the company had. I'd like you to write about my great-grandfather, Charles Hill Morgan, Paul said to me. He's been forgotten by history, and I think more people ought to know about him. Charles lived from 1831 to 1911, and no one alive today knew him personally. Paul and I both knew I hadn't written a full-blown biography before, but if I thought of it as just a really long profile, I decided I, I could take on the assignment. I had a lot to learn. Um, a biography is an enormous responsibility to tell a person's life story in a memorable and ideally compelling way. According to a 1910 entry in Encyclopedia Britannica, a biography should be the faithful portrait of a soul in its adventures through life. And biographers do this. We find a way to tell the story of a life and hopefully well, tell it well after sifting through, at least in my case, so much primary source material. Diaries with cryptic references, endless company records of transactions and expense reports, patent records, legal depositions, letters and letter books, which are bound onion skin paper copies of correspondence where the original letter is pressed onto the sheets before the ink dries. Brown ink, after it fades. I spent a lot of time in an assortment of cubicles at Morgan's offices on Belmont Street, moving as they needed the space for more project managers, more finance staff, and then more IT people. Whoops. Did I step on something? 
I unplugged myself, excuse me. <laughs> Help. <laughs> well, let's try it. Can you, can you hear me? No, it's not plugged in. I think I must have. Oh, uh, it's just a loose connection, I think. Try now. What do you think? Yeah. All right, I will try and keep my feet still. That's the problem. I was moving around. Thank you, Diane. No more tap dancing at the podium. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So, uh, so I was moving around in Morgan Construction's offices, and the historic when Siemens acquired Morgan Construction in 2008, the historical material I was working with moved bit by bit to the WPI archives. So I spent more hours in the basement of Gordon Library there. Thankfully, there were ways to escape the basement. I hit the road to learn more, first to the town where Charles L. Morgan spent his teen years, Lancaster, Massachusetts. In response to my questions about his early schooling, the Thayer Library keeper of Lancastriana suggested that I read his biography. And I had to explain that there wasn't one yet, but I was working to change that situation. Then I visited the Clinton Historical Society, as Clinton spun off from Lancaster as its own town in 1850, when Charles was 19. Only open for three hours a week on Saturday mornings, the Historical Society was a welcoming place. I became a fixture there for a month or two. I tried to keep a low profile, but clearly I was so unobtrusive that on one Saturday, they closed up the building and locked me in. So. I had some explaining to do when Clinton's police force arrived at the door as I set off the alarm trying to unlock the door to leave. Oh, they haven't asked me to speak yet. I'm not sure why. <laughs> so I also traveled to Alston, Massachusetts, the Baker Library at the Harvard Business School, which held the records for the company Charles Hill Morgan worked for for 23 years, the Washburn and Moen Company, Manufacturing Company, which, as Diane said, was later acquired by American Steel and Wire and then U.S. Steel. In order to gain access to their priceless resources, I had to ask the Harvard Business School alumnus, Philip Morgan, to send a letter vouching for me as his research assistant. Closer to home, I was lucky to have the American Antiquarian Society's amazing collection of newspapers to peruse for information about Morgan and the broader news events of his lifetime. And when I wanted to know about which public school his son might have attended when they moved to Prescott Street in 1864, a visit to the Worcester Public Library got me the school committee records for that year in no time flat. I also traveled further afield to London, where my daughter was on a semester abroad, but also where Morgan had gone to see a cemetery in Hampstead. I went there too, and I found the plaque he directed to honor Henry Court, an early pioneer in metal rolling, and he was buried there. It was Shrove Tuesday, the day before Ash Wednesday, and the archivist shared her pancakes with me, as well as some records about Morgan's efforts to refurbish Court's grave. While the primary sources were essential, I could not have filled, filled in many of the blanks about what life was like in the 1800s without online sources, lots of them. Google Books has scans of nearly every book printed before 1923 when copyright laws changed. Um, if they were on a library shelf sometime in the last 10 years. Old maps, business directories, magazine articles. What was it like to work in Philadelphia during the Civil War, as Morgan had? I found information on the web. How does a steam engine work? Some, several people in this room might be able to answer that question. I needed to look it up. What were the patent laws in the 1850s or the 1880s? How long did it take to ride a train from Worcester to Boston? As I researched and wrote and researched some more, the questions just kept coming. My publisher asked for an introduction to set Morgan's life in the context of Worcester's industrial evolution. So I had more research to do. Thankfully, Professor John Anderson at Holy Cross created a thankfully short syllabus for me so I could consult the key publications on the subject. The final product, The Inventive Life of Charles L. Morgan, is certainly the mama profile of them all at just over 400 pages, with, with lots of illustrations. While of course I'm hoping you'll buy a copy, I'd like to give you a little preview of the book with some photos to help you enter his world. Charles Morgan was a self-taught engineer who revolutionized the commercial production of paper bags and then steel rods. Born in 1831, he died three days after his 80th birthday in January 1911. In his lifetime, the United States went from 24 to 46 states from 13 million to 94 million people. 
Trains, telegrams, and telephones became commonplace. And while Henry Ford had not begun his assembly line production in Detroit, the motor car was a novelty seen more and more frequently on this city's streets. Morgan's house, over on Catherine Street, just up the hill from Adcare Hospital today, was one of the first to have its own elevator, adapted from a hydraulic one that he designed together with Milton Higgins. Morgan's first patent was awarded in 1857, his last in 1908. For Charles Morgan, there was always a better way to achieve something, both in work and in life. His life was one of constant improvement. He helped Ichabod Washburn establish in 1868 the manufacturing shop that remains at WPI today. He went on to serve as a WPI trustee for the rest of his life. He helped found a church here in Worcester, Plymouth Church, which stood across the street from today's New England Dream Center on the corner of Chestnut and Pearl Streets. I think it's a parking lot now. When the Worcester YMCA needed revitalizing in 1881, he contributed to the building fund for a facility on Elm and Pearl Streets. He joined their building committee in 1887, and later the education committee, physical committee, and in 1894, the executive committee. Through these activities and his generous gifts, I learned more about Morgan as a man, not just as an engineer and businessman. As a philanthropist, Morgan subscribed to the philosophy espoused by Dr. Daniel Kimball Pearsons, a hard scrabble Vermont physician who moved west to the Chicago area and made millions in real estate and timber. Pearsons believed in leverage. He would offer to give a small college $25 or $50,000 if they in turn raised $150,000. A number of Morgan's gifts supported institutions where Pearson had made such promises, including Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington, and Berea College in Berea, Kentucky. Morgan was in good company following Pearson's lead as another devotee was Andrew Carnegie. He referred to Pearson's as the senior partner in the business of benevolence. Carnegie instructed his secretary to give wherever Pearson's gave. Morgan also supported education at schools founded through the American Missionary Association, including Talladega College, Alabama's oldest private historically black liberal arts college. Let me read you a short excerpt from the book about this. A March 21, 1902 diary entry notes that he agreed to give $500 to Talladega in case they buy the 300-acre farm adjoining their real estate. He must have requested that his gift remain anonymous as a catalog from 1904 merely recognizes the funds contributed by a friend of the college to purchase 515 acres of a neighboring plantation. Two years later, he agreed to send $500 to Talladega College by October 1st after a fire burned down the school's model barn that had only been erected six years earlier. He was responsive to calls for emergency funds, one obituary noting that he gave $250 to the San Francisco Earthquake Relief Fund. His gifts were not always cash. In October 1908, he sent two thoroughbred Jersey bull calves to the Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute in Virginia. They traveled via Providence by Adams Express, a commercial courier service much like today's Federal Express. Can you imagine getting a calf through FedEx? So Morgan's support for the Hampton Institute dated back to the 1870s for its work in educating freed slaves. Booker T. Washington was an early graduate of that school. October 1909 found him shipping another bull calf to the Brick Industrial School in eastern North Carolina. Founded in 1895 to educate poor black children, the school was named for its benefactor, Julia Brick of New York, who on the advice of the American Missionary Association, deeded her North Carolina plantation to the school in 1890. Designed for both boarding and day students, the coeducational school believed in both academic and trade education. Students learned farming, blacksmithing, woodworking, mechanical drawing, and cabinet making. Farm produce and a mail order honey business generated needed revenues for the school. The calf, a jersey, was no small gift. Charles's diary notes its pedigree. The blue ribbon winning sire was eminent fifth, and his dam was Kintra. One of his greatest gifts was to Memorial Hospital, bringing us right back to Worcester, far from the south, just two blocks down the hill from his home on Catherine Street. 
By 1905, it had just 60 beds, not enough to meet demand. Mabel Gage, the daughter of Morgan's physician, Thomas Gage, undertook what came to be called a whirlwind campaign, raising in one month $34,000, this is 1905, remember, for a new children's ward. This success encouraged the hospital trustees to launch a citywide effort to solicit funds for the hospital's expansion. Morgan responded to the call, honoring his wife, Rebecca, with a $40,000 gift for the construction of a maternity ward. You can see the results of that right there. Given the tragic childbed death of his first wife, Harriet, together with their newborn son, Hiram, this gift to improve maternal care would certainly have held a special significance for him. While a generous philanthropist, Charles Morgan was also an astute businessman. He was a man who fought for his ideas. When he invented a way to automate the coiling of rod wire as it flew out red hot out of a mill, his employer, Washburn and Moen, which is in today's North Works on Grove Street, they wanted to own the idea. But Morgan had a deal with them to profit from his own ideas. So they asked the young man who had viewed Morgan as his mentor, Fred Harris Daniels, to claim the idea as his. An eight-year battle ensued, with Morgan prevailing only after the Supreme Court declared that the idea was indeed his own. Yeah. Here's the patent. And Fred Harris Daniels. But Morgan had his own personal trials. After his first wife died in 1862 in childbirth, he did remarry, but his oldest son, Harry, who was eight when he lost his mother, became a source of worry for his father for most of his life. Just after Harry's 21st birthday, he suffered an industrial accident at Washburn and Moen and lost his right leg below the knee. Harry traveled to England, ostensibly to learn from the great iron masters, but he secretly married a widow with a young daughter. It was two years before Charles found this out. Not surprisingly, once the patent battle he'd, oh, man. Okay, <laughs> try and stand still. Not surprisingly, once the patent battle heated up, Charles left his position as superintendent at Washburn and Moen in 1887 and started his own company, Morgan Construction, the next year. He was 57 years old, an age when most men retired as life expectancies rarely exceeded 60 in those days. And his ideas kept coming. Oh, here's Harry. He wasn't above sketching his ideas on hotel letterhead or whatever scraps of paper came to hand. Here's one of them. Charles had four other children, and the second son, Paul, would end up running the company within 10 years of its founding. Harry worked for his father and younger brother for a time, but eventually moved out of town. Thinking about his own legacy, Charles spent time researching the life of Henry Court, whose 18th century invention in puddling iron improved the quality of England's iron production which helped that country's defenses. They hadn't actually been able to buy, make their own iron. They had to import it from other countries, which was difficult if they were actually going to be at war with them. So, sorry, there's some family shots. Here's the plaque honoring Henry Court in London. While Charles continued pursuing new ways to manufacture steel rods, in 1905, he bought a farm in Boylston, known as Hillside, or the Guff Estate, as it had been owned by the temperance activist John Guff. You tell me if I'm saying it wrong. There he played the role of gentleman farmer, enjoyed his prized Jersey cows, descendants of some of the earliest ones imported into the US. He entered them into agricultural affairs and won a few blue ribbons. He had previously owned purebred English bull mastiffs, dogs that come up to your waist. He also bought his first car in 1908, a Chalmers Detroit 30 touring car, and took great pleasure in racing around Worcester County in it. His death on January 11th, 1911 was front page news in Worcester. The company closed early so that hundreds of employees could attend his funeral. At the time, Morgan Construction was one of hundreds of manufacturing businesses in the city as this ad from the Worcester Board of Trade, a predecessor of our Worcester Chamber, demonstrates with the slogan, Worcester Made Invites Trade. Morgan Construction continued for five generations, and the location on Belmont Street at Lincoln Square was only recently sold to the Mass College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences University. It's been an amazing journey for me to take on the responsibility to tell someone's life story. 
Biography can help us learn from others' experiences, and I believe can give us hope that we can all improve ourselves in some way. If you know of another group that would like to hear me speak about Charles Hill Morgan and that period of industrial success in Worcester, please let me know. I have a sign-up sheet next to the books if you'd like to receive more information about him and my work in telling stories about other people's lives. Feel free to share, share your email with me. Thank you. I am willing to take some questions. It's so good to hear you talk about this industrial uh, period in Pune, Worcester, uh, especially the last half of the 1800s. And I know the Worcester Historical Museum has this dedicated section to that era. A truly remarkable time. We made everything. We did. 1,300 different kinds of products, I think, at one point. Uh, we, by the way, there's a time of us and Memorial Hospital of Cedric's as well. Uh, this club and other Rotary Clubs have, in the last couple of years, uh, purchased cameras at the bedside of the creams <coughs> in the NICU section. And we have been a very, it's been a very successful campaign, but we have a, a tie to Memorial Hospital, which was the beneficiary of some of the sort of charity. <laughs> Starting the, I guess it started that department. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there must be some questions. Intellectual curiosity. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, you know, you were saying, where could you give a talk? I would think to the Worcester Historical Museum and the American Antiquarian Society, and then there's a beautiful museum in Boston, um, the Ar the Is it the Arboretum? What's the yeah. word? Yeah. Garden. The Athenaeum. The Boston Athenaeum. The Boston Athenaeum. It's a private library. Those three yeah. places would be good. Oh, thank you. I'll keep that in mind. Yes, questions. Jeff. Can you talk a little bit about his innovations with paper making, paper bags, and, and uh, uh, steel making? Sure. Um, basically, what he did was he figured out a way to manufacture a machine that would manufacture paper bags. Some early inventors had come up with one kind, so he wasn't the very first person to invent it, but what he figured out was a way to do it in a commercially viable way. So he made the machines, and then he would license them to different uh, or companies across the country, and then they would have a license for a specific geographical portion. So his paper, making, paper bag making machinery was, for example, in the New York area or the Ohio, Indiana area, or Baltimore, that sort of thing. And so that was his, his first real business, was the paper bag company, Morgan Brothers, it was called. And on the steel side, once he started working for Ichabod Washburn in Washburn and Mullen, um, Ichabod Washburn had learned about a new way of manufacturing steel rods in England and brought that information back to Worcester. Actually, I think he built a mill like um, that, and Charles Morgan improved on it by basically coming up with a way to twist the rod so that you didn't have to have the machinery um, rearranged in a way. It could go straight through the machine, turning the rod rather than having to come up with new kinds of rollers. And it enabled it to go much faster. And that those steel rods would then be drawn into wire, which back in the 1870s and 80s became very important for barbed wire production. And in fact, Worcester was pretty much the center of barbed wire production because Washburn and Mullen bought up all the patents of all the barbed wire manufacturers so that they, they cornered the market and that was all happening under his watch. Yes? Yeah, Allison, can you talk about the relationship to Siemens and then also to what extent Morgan family is still involved today? Well, Morgan, uh, Morgan Construction was purchased by Siemens um, in 2008. Um, Philip Morgans and Dan Morgan stayed on with the company, I think, for about two years. And then Philip retired in November 2010. So there are currently no Morgan family members employed in Siemens, which is now Siemens VAI Metals Technology LLC. And it's still headquartered in Worcester uh, over on Prescott Street, and the manufacturing still goes strong on Crescent Street. So the original furnace that was a Siemens furnace, was that the same company then? Yeah, it was. In fact, Morgan wrote to Siemens 
telling him about some of the experiments he'd done with metal and how the furnace was or wasn't working very well for his needs. So they had been related to each other in the 1800s? Yeah, yeah. yeah they would, the, this industrial company talked to each other. It's pretty amazing. Long distance, you know, transatlantic mail, but yeah. Yes, Peter. Allison, during your talk, you mentioned Milton Higgins. Yes. And he's a Worcester industrialist. <laughs> Can you tell us how that worked out or how that came to be? Sure. Thanks for that leading question. Um, so Ichabod Washburn um, was instrumental in founding WPI, as you probably all read a lot about in the paper just last weekend with the inauguration of the new president. Um, he and, and John Templeton. Um, and Washburn very much wanted there to be uh, two premises of both theory and practice in a WPI education. The practice part was going to be learning how to manufacture things. And that's why I had the picture of the drawing stand, which was one of the first products that students made. Well, the manufacturing shop needed a supervisor. And so Ichabod Washburn asked Charles Morgan, please find someone to run it. And there weren't a lot of engineering schools in those days, but he managed to head up towards Dartmouth. And in Hanover, New Hampshire, he found Milton Higgins, who had finally finished the engineering program there, he had to take some time off to work because he couldn't afford it to go straight through. So he not only had industrial experience and the engineering training, and he brought him from New Hampshire down to Worcester to head up the Washburn shops. Um, worked for Washburn and Mullen for a few months while they were still finishing building the building. But Milton Higgins did that quite successfully, and then he started this little company. He was one of a couple people involved as the Norton Company. So, and then he was very involved, as many of you know, in working with other people in the city to get some vocational training for the school, for founding Boys Trade. Um, and that was, I think, relatively near the end of Milton Higgins' life, but that's certainly part of his legacy for the city as well. You're welcome. Yes. WPI was central to a lot of this. Because the, as I know the story, I'm I'm a Norton Norton guy. Um, the first laboratory R and D mm -hmm. for Norton was in fact on the WPI campus. And uh, Peter may know this. I believe the first director of research for Norton was actually a professor at WPI. I can't but possibly all of them. Very close to Very close to the Washburn Labs. Yeah. That's the, uh, I'm, there's a lot of collaboration going on in those days. And they seem to be filling this catalyst role again. So we certainly hope so. <laughs> yeah. I know the city is really hoping for that, so yeah. Yes? Do you have a family tree in your book? I do. That was I worked with a writing group in producing this, and getting through all these names, they said, you have to put a tree in there. <laughs> but I have to say, neither Peter nor Mary are on that tree, because we had a limited amount of space, and I decided that the tree would begin with the people that were alive when Charles Hill Morgan was alive. So there may be a couple of extra of his grandchildren that showed up after 1911, but it basically starts with his dad and then ends with his grandchildren. So Peter is a grandchild of Charles? Great grandchild. Oh, I just missed the cut. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. All these guys born in the 1920s are just a little bit too late. So. Uh, yes. Did uh, Mr. Morgan understand his legacy and what he was leaving behind in the end of his life? Did he have any concept of what he was actually leaving behind? There's a great quote about that in the book, which I can't necessarily put my finger on this second. But he basically said to Paul before he died, because Paul had, was running the company at that point, that he's not leaving him much but he is leaving him the company. And Peter may actually know the quote better than I do. you got the spirit of the it. The spirit I'm of not it. leaving you much money, but I'm leaving you an institution which in the end may be worth more, more valuable than yeah. it was. Absolutely. For five generations, yes. Is that it? Well, thank you, Alice. Thank you.